What's up, I Do Podcast listeners? Welcome to the show. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you have are having a great week. And if you started the 14-day Happy Couple Challenge with us when we did last Wednesday, then you'll be on day seven. And if not, head on over to our website at idopodcast.com and sign up and your day one, your 14 days will start today. And it's called the 14-Day Happy Couple Challenge because it is a challenge to keep up with (laughs) sometimes. (laughs) It is. But, uh, you know, because you're getting an email a day and there's lots of things that I know when we first went through it and, and all the things that are recommended were not necessarily things that we were doing. So you really have to make a conscious effort, but don't get down on yourself if you're not keeping up with it. You don't have to do everything on that day. But what it is is just valuable tips and one specific tip from um, who, who, past guest, what was, what's Esther her name? Esther Boykin. That's right. Esther was kind enough to provide us with this email series. And it's just really great things that we've heard time and again on our show, but it's broken down. She gives us the science of why you should be doing it and how it's going to help your relationship. And they're little things. I think day seven is what? Date night? Date night. Yeah. yeah. And that's something we hear all the time. But and I think intrinsically, a lot of people know that, yeah, like you need to date your partner and keep it keep it new and fresh, yeah. especially if you're married and been married for a while. But we don't actually do it. And, and Sarah and I, we're guilty of it, right? Yeah, I'm, we are. You know, it's you get a two-year-old and busy lives and job and... It's easy to kind of just get in the routine of not spending time on yourself and uh, with your partner. So making it date night, even if it's not on day seven, you know, make it another day that week. Um, You know, it's just about trying to incorporate those tips into your daily routine so that it can help improve your relationship. Yeah, don't feel like this is uh, like some reality. What is it? Survivor challenge, like <laughs> cutthroat. Got to stay up on it and uh, we're going to be grading you. Yeah. And if uh, like Chase said, if, if you can't do them every day, maybe do them every other day and, and spread it out over a month instead of the two weeks. Yeah. So check that out on I do podcast dot com. Sign up. And even if you're single, they're good things to know going into a relationship. So a lot of the things we talk about. Uh, can apply to if you're in a relationship or not. But certainly, I think uh, it's hard to gauge, but I feel like a lot of you guys out there, we have a mix. We have people that write and say, I've been dating and in and out of relationships and and people that are married or people are going to get married. So uh, yeah, write us in, let us know how this challenge is helping you or the podcast and and let us know uh, your, uh, what is it, status, uh, relationship status. That's the word I'm looking for single, married, dating, what's going on with you and uh, how how uh, we're helping or some things that you would like to hear. And on today's show, we have another great episode that'll help you if you're single, married or dating, like a lot of the things. We have Dr. Lisa Firestone and Dr. Firestone is the Director of Research and Education at the Glendon Association and Senior Editor for the Mental Health Website psych alive dot org and she is also the author of numerous articles and chapters and the co author of several books including Conquer Your Critical Inner Voice, Creating a Life of Meaning and Compassion, Sex and Love in Intimate Relationships, and a few more. So she has an extensive background in working with couples, writing uh, some great stuff, some great resources. She does e-courses. Uh, she has a podcast herself. So just a lot of a lot of uh, experience that she's bringing to the podcast. And today we talk about vulnerability and being vulnerable with your partner, or maybe you have an easy time being vulnerable and getting your partner to be more vulnerable and open up to you. And why do you want that? It's going to make you guys closer. It's going to create more intimacy. You're going to feel like you know your partner more. And I feel like it's something that's definitely lacking in a lot of relationships. I know 
I wouldn't say it's lacking in ours, but it's something that we can always work on uh, that's important because it's really the backbone of feeling like you know your partner. Yeah, I think there's a common uh, thread throughout the interview, which to me kind of rang out as positivity. So Dr. Firestone gave us a lot of tips about how you can turn situations positive or make positive remarks or comment comments instead of focusing on the negative. And one of the biggest uh, comments or one of the biggest tips that she made that um, we'll definitely be able to implement in our relationship is saying what you want instead of what you don't want. So focusing on that positive, uh, something that your partner or that you can actually implement into the relationship versus a bunch of things that you may not like in the relationship. Yeah. Like if your partner, if if it's something that, uh, Hey, take out the trash and that really bothers you. Um, but for some other reason, rather than saying, why don't you mind your own business or something like <laughs> something negative or whatever response you would give or like, Oh, you always bug me with that. You could, turn it into a positive and say, you know, uh, why I'll take out the trash. Um, but maybe don't ask me, um, right before we go to bed. Um, I'd like to do it in the morning and, and it's easy to not have that response, but, uh, really being conscious. Right. Or, or just saying something like, you know, I really love when, um, the, when the dishes are done, when you do those, you know, you're, you're telling your partner exactly what makes you happy instead of saying, Oh, I hate when you leave all the dirty dishes around. It just leaves an extra mess for me. So yeah. just kind of staying positive and, and being mindful about how you communicate. Yeah. That positive reinforcement and the way it ties into vulnerability is that'll help you encourage more vulnerability from your partner if everything is negative or they feel like it's not a safe space, they're definitely less likely to be vulnerable in the relationship. So a lot of great stuff in today's episode. And as always, we really appreciate you guys listening, subscribing on iTunes, leaving those five-star reviews. We always love those and and telling your friends and family. And we're just continuing to grow here. Uh, This summer has been great. The number of you guys listening continues to rise and it's hard to gauge. We don't get a, a ton of feedback because it's definitely podcasting is is a one way medium for the most part. But we get a steady stream of emails and, and Facebook messages of of people saying, "Hey, I listened to this or that episode and really helped me." And and that's awesome to hear because we're just right here along with you guys, learning from our guests, experts, and uh, it, it's great to to know that we're learning and that you guys are improving your relationships. Yeah, we really do enjoy the emails that you send us. It makes our day and it really allows us to keep bringing you this great information. So we hope you guys enjoy the episode. Today's show is sponsored by Talkspace, the online therapy company that lets you choose from over 1,500 licensed therapists. Get matched with your perfect therapist who can put you on a path to a happier life. For $30 off your first month, visit Talkspace.com forward slash I do. That's Talkspace.com forward slash I do. Hi, Dr. Firestone. Thanks so much for joining us on the show today. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. We've given our listeners a little overview of your extensive background in helping people improve their relationships. So why don't you tell us and our listeners why you enjoy doing that so much? Um, Because I think that good relationships are really the key to happiness. And I really think that they're so important in our lives. And if I can help people have better relationships, um, that's very fulfilling to me. Well, today's topic, I think we both believe is a really important one because it's a major thing that we try to work on. And I know, I'm sure you see a lot of individuals and couples that this is a big problem. And that is vulnerability and being vulnerable in a relationship and what that can 
allow it to do or how it can hold it back. So let's just jump right in and talk about what it means to be vulnerable. I think it means to show, be willing to show the other person how you're really feeling, to be open about your pain, about what you really want, um, and to let them really see who you are. Now, the advantage is then you feel seen. Um, it also means that you might not get that response, but the real finding in general is that the more vulnerable you're willing to be in relationships, the more that draws out caring and um, connection with your partner. And why is it so darn hard to be vulnerable? I think because we learn very early in our life, in our earliest relationships, that sometimes when we're vulnerable, we get hurt. Um, sometimes those are lessons or messages that are reinforced in other relationships. But I think often, the you know, it may happen when we're little, but that we tend to then kind of shut down to even knowing what we want a lot of times. Um, you know, if when we're born, we adapt to whatever social environment we're born into. And if our needs are not responded to um, in a way where we feel seen and uh, soothed at times when we're distressed um, and safe, then we learn not to be so in touch with those needs, especially if over and over again, we express a need and it doesn't get met. And by that, I mean, at our earliest is just crying for food or warmth or whatever when we need something when we're a baby, that we sort of push down connection with those needs. We don't even really recognize that we have them. We may, uh, other people who say they have needs, we may think, oh, why are they so needy? Um, it also, it can just be painful, I guess, for people to be in touch with their needs because of some of those old hurts. So I, I guess I'll jump right in and, and ask, what is the first step for somebody to work on being vulnerable or for our listeners, if their partner is not uh, being vulnerable with them, how can they start to um, open them up to be vulnerable in the relationship? Right. If it's your partner that you're concerned about, it really means creating a safe environment for them. Um, so they feel like they can be vulnerable. And I can't tell you how many couples I've worked with where they'll say things like, I wish this, you know, my partner would talk more and say more what they feel. And then the minute their partner opens their mouth, even in our sessions, they bite their head off. Um, that does not going to make your partner be more vulnerable with you. It really means having to listen. And even when it's really hard, um, maybe your partner says some things that are really hard for you to hear, either pain that they're experiencing, that it's hard for you uh, to acknowledge or to allow to be, or it could be some criticism they have of you or something they want from you that feels hard to hear. Um, whatever it is, if you can really listen and whatever feelings you have, be able to sit with those and maybe doing a little meditation beforehand or breathing um, can be helpful, but really to draw them out, but to make it safe for them. Because if they feel safe, if they feel seen for who they really are and they feel like you're ready to soothe them if they're distressed, they're going to feel more like they can take a chance with you and be vulnerable. So that's what you can do if it's your partner. If it's you who struggles with being vulnerable, first of all, it's really important to first of all, just acknowledge that maybe you do struggle with being vulnerable because most of us do. It does not make you unusual. It does not make you bad. Um, it means that for whatever reason, you learn to kind of push down those needs or wants. And it means trying to get in touch with, so an interaction happens between you and your partner. Often what we want to do is lash back or we want to say something like, I don't want you to treat me that way anymore. Or I don't want this. But the real question to ask yourself is, what do you want? It's much easier for people uh, in relationships to say what they don't want their partner to do than to say what they really want. And if you can get in touch with what you really want, that's a much more vulnerable place. And when you do that, your partner is very much more likely to reach out. So even if you've had a fight or even if you think your partner's done something wrong, if you can identify what's the part that you did that wasn't so great and say, you know, I'm sorry I did that. Often then your partner can say, you know, I'm sorry I did this part. But if you jump down their throat and say, you did this, they're very likely to get defensive and say, no, I didn't. And then, you know, you don't get anywhere. That's a really important thing to recognize. And 
try to do because I know I'm guilty of saying what I don't like when when Sarah when there's something that maybe triggers me emotionally and I'm definitely going to be able to use that and hopefully our listeners find some value in there rather than say I don't like this it's like I'm proposing a solution by saying this is what I I would like you to do rather than the negative and so now we're able to move forward with a solution to to what it is that's bothering me Mm -hmm. and I know that if Chase or uh, if our listeners, one of their partners, they give a solution like that, it's a lot easier to implement it as well. Right. And and you want to do what your partner wants. When you're being criticized or told what they don't want or don't like about how you're treating them, then you tend to get more, like I said, on the defensive. But if you're, you know, from a calmer place, which you are when they say what they do want, you can take that in differently. And it's also interesting to try to get out What's underneath that want? You know, what is it? And sometimes we have wants like, you know, I want you to love me all the time, no matter what I do. (laughs) You know, I mean, and that may be asking too much, really. But if you can say that feeling, that's a basic primitive feeling that we have. Um, Or, you know, wanting our partner to always be paying attention to us. And if you can acknowledge those feelings, then you can also say, yeah, I know it's not completely realistic, but what, you know, but I would like if in these situations, when we're talking and I'm trying to tell you something that you'd really pay attention, I really want you to hear me. That is a extremely in relevant tool that I know that we'll be able to use because I think more often than not, I am saying what it is that I dislike. And I think that's a common first reaction is, is just be that, to receive the input and say, no, no, don't do that. And, uh, but it takes understanding it and then being consciously aware and present and getting out of the habit because it's that initial reaction of what I don't want. I'm sure in a lot of others as well that that's just an automatic response. So training ourselves to come back with a a positive response uh, takes time, but it's an important thing to be able to do. Yeah. Yeah, it is. It does take time. And I think the other does come much more naturally. And it's also more, you feel safer saying, you know, I don't want this, or you feel like you're being strong. To be vulnerable and say, no, I want this is a very different thing. But it is very likely to also then soften your partner and make them want to give it to you. So in addition to saying what you uh, what you do want, from the relationship, are there any other uh, tools or tips uh, couples can implement to help them be more vulnerable? Yeah, they can try to create an atmosphere of safety with each other so that your partner can say, you know, that really made me angry, you know, or, you know, can talk about their feelings without feeling like it's a dangerous place. Um, You know, that's in terms of opening our partner up. I think in terms of us opening up, it's really trying to get in touch with, okay, underneath that anger or that, ooh, I didn't like that, what's the real feeling? And like uh, you mentioned previously, it takes being present, slowing down, taking the time to tune into what's really going on inside of you. How did you experience that or feel that? And I think, you know, as couples, we are just in our, as people in our lives, we're often very busy and we have a lot of other things going on. And it can be hard to take the time we need to slow down and really be present with each other. My husband and I have developed this routine of Friday after work, about five o'clock, meeting outside of our offices and taking a walk for, you know, and and that being kind of a time to download some of the things that have happened to us in the week and talk about them. and, And then really sitting down and having a meal together where we can look at each other and make contact. And I think those things make it more possible and more likely that you're going to have vulnerable moments with your partner if you take the time to slow down and do those things together. Creating that space is so key because we have a two-year-old and we're both working and it's hard to make the time, but you have to do just that. You have to make it. So like you're saying with your husband, it seems like it's a pretty regular set thing that you guys are doing, taking that walk. I would really encourage our listeners, and I know that's something Sarah and I are always trying to work on is creating that time because even if there's not 
something negative going on. You don't have to be fighting or in a disagreement to create that time to solve it. It's really about making your relationship better and being more vulnerable because I know the times that Sarah and I, it's not an argument, but we're just expressing our deeper emotions, desires, dreams, opening up, being vulnerable, that connection, it's just immediate that that you feel towards your partner. So it's such a, a good thing to have in your life. Yeah, and because it, it's easy to grow apart in the fact that we're so busy. And um, it is really important to make that time. And I do think the face-to-face contact matters. Um, I do think the walking is also good beforehand because it kind of, or it doesn't have to be walking. It could be some other physical activity, but or something that's just rhythmical that gets you in a calm place. So you're more likely to be present when you do the face-to-face time. And then, yeah, like you said, it doesn't have to be because there's an argument or something, but just like what's going on inside of you and what's going inside of the other person and taking time for that to be important enough uh, to check in with each other is really, really important. Like you said, it just adds to the depth of the relationship and it is hard. And especially when you have young children, um, you know, to make that time because you've got your jobs and then they've got those demands. And then, you know, children do need your time and attention. And at that age, they don't understand that maybe they need to wait while you guys are having a conversation. (laughs) That's not going to happen, right? So, you know, it's maybe taking some time where you're actually out of the house, but not at work, where you can do that. And yes, it's one more thing to do, but it will keep your relationship stronger. And that's so important for each of you and for your children, too. Yeah, I think, I don't know what the exact quote is, but it, it's something in the lines of a routine creates habit. So doing like you do on Fridays, you know, every Friday with your husband, you meet and you enjoy a meal and just doing that in, over and over creates a routine and it's something that will uh, really benefit a relationship. Yeah, and I think, you know, the reason I think we need to make it a routine partly is because Otherwise, it gets kind of lost, you know, in all the to-do things that are on our list. And yet we don't think about the fact that to keep our relationship healthy, it does take time. It takes some shared interest and experiences. And, you know, hanging out with your two-year-old can be a shared experience. It doesn't mean that all these things have to be away from children. They can be included in that. To build relationships with our children, we need time-sharing things, too. But, um, But it does if we make it a set thing and set up some routines around it, we're more likely to do it. It's definitely not an easy thing to do. And it's funny. I'm just thinking we've consciously had to say, all right, no Netflix tonight because let's, let's talk and catch up because, you know, every night we, we eat dinner, we have the routine, put the baby down and it's not, we're not having any, negative necessarily any negative uh things that we need to solve any conflict but we just have a i i might call it a a negative routine of put the baby down after dinner watch watch our show and then go to sleep but the day is hectic and at no point are we making that time to to be vulnerable or to talk and and catch up this is something that it's easy to fall into. So we have made a conscious effort to be like, all right, no, no TV tonight. And we need to do it more actually. And let's just, or we're working on the podcast or you name it, but let's, let's take, even if it's 30 minutes to really set aside and just be like, Hey, how are you doing? (laughs) What's going on? Right. And, and, and sometimes it's even harder when there isn't some pressing issue you need to talk about, but that's, this time really should be for not, dealing with all the practical things that you have to deal with, but for really just checking in with how each of you are feeling. Um, And that really uh, matters. Yeah. And it is easy to get out of the habit. And partly we need some downtime too, where we're kind of doing nothing and TV watching kind of fits into that. Um, You know, we're being entertained from the outside and not really having to think. And that feels really good. And I'm not trying to say that time isn't important too, but it's the balance and giving your relationship importance. Um, and making it healthier for the long run. So as parents, you mentioned that we have all become vulnerable 
most likely from our childhood and from our experiences with our parents. So how can we, besides being present and, and more mindful, how can we not push those insecurities or the lack of being vulnerable to our children so that it doesn't become, you know, like a, a vicious cycle of, of not being vulnerable? Right. I think we can show our children that we could be vulnerable. I think we have to model it. If they see us willing to do that, they're going to be more vulnerable. Um, and, you know, in terms of their attachment to us and having a healthy attachment where they feel secure and then develop that inner security to feel like they can be vulnerable, um, the best thing we can do is make them feel safe, <laughs> make them feel seen for who they really are. So that means not imposing our ideas of who they are, like, oh, they're going to be a great baseball player, or oh, she's going to be the most beautiful girl, or she's going to be the smartest, or whatever, that we just really find out who they are and learn who they are um, and see them for who they are, including their strengths and weaknesses, um, and are able to reflect our understanding of that to them. Uh, they also need to feel that they can be soothed when they're distressed. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect, by the way. Uh, good parents get it right about 30% of the time. It's not 100%, but it's good when to know. You, yeah, yeah. Because I think that illusion, you know, especially for first time parents, is like, oh, I'm going to do this perfectly and get it all right. And it doesn't work like that. Um, I know two new parents of a one month old, and, you know, they're not getting any sleep. They really like this baby and they're doing really well with it. And she's a really easy to soothe baby, so they're lucky. But, you know, they are. Um, definitely a bit stressed out, just even from the lack of sleep. Um, so um, it's getting it right 30% of the time. And when we miss, um, when we do something that we later think, oh, that didn't sound so good, or I wish I hadn't said that, that we go back and we talk to our child about it. And we say, you know, how was that for you? Well, how did that? How did you experience that? And then we really listen. And again, just like when we're trying to listen to our partner and what they want, we're really trying to get in a calm place, just really pay attention to our child, get on eye level with them and really try to hear their experience. Now, from a two year old, you're not going to um, get a necessarily coherent verbal dialogue about it. But um, but you can still say, you know, I'm sorry I did that. And I can see that upset you if they're crying or, you know, and that that really matters um, because that's showing your child that you can be vulnerable and you can tell them when you got it wrong. Um, and they will feel more able to be vulnerable with you and later in the future with future partners. So much of what we talk about on a relationship podcast involves examining our past and, and understanding how we became the person we are. And a lot of it is through childhood. So now as parents to a, a two-year-old, it's funny because everything we're hearing, they're like, oh, well, that, that can be based on your attachment style that's formed when you're a, a, a child. Now It makes you hyper aware as a parent, like, oh, we're shaping how uh, our daughter is going to relate uh, later in life. So it that's great information, and I'm sure we have a lot of parents listening that uh, pretty much almost every show, it comes up because that is so much of it's how we receive love, how we communicate, um, how if we're being vulnerable or not. So it, it's really fascinating. That could be a whole separate podcast is, is developing a child that's going to have healthy relationships. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but a lot of the same principles go into being a good partner and being a good parent. You know, that ability to be present, to be mindful, as you mentioned, both of those you mentioned, and then to really, you know, take that time to listen, to do repair. When we have a rupture in our romantic relationship, to take the time to repair. And, you know, one thing we suggest to people, something we call unilateral disarmament, um, that when your par when you and your partner get into something or, you know, somebody lashes out, that instead of lashing back, which is our natural, often go-to response, to instead um, say something caring and maybe even put a hand on the person and say, you know, I'd rather be close to you than have this conversation right now or than to get into this. If you can drop your guard in that way, it'll often melt the other person's heart. Uh, you also don't escalate the situation or say a number of things that are hurtful that you later regret. 
Um, and you can at least feel good about who you're being in this situation, if, even if it doesn't melt your partner's heart. Um, otherwise, you're handing over all your personal power to your partner that if they lash out, that you're definitely going to lash back. And, you know, you really want to own your own personal power to be who you want to be in your relationship, no matter what your partner does. Well, kudos to the person that can do that. That's definitely something to strive for. But it and it, we actually had an incident, a uh, argument like that where it just kind of escalated. I was triggered, and and had Sarah done that, I was definitely in the wrong. But had she done that, I think things would have cooled down right away. And and Sarah's definitely more level headed a lot of times than than I am and that's such a powerful thing to be able to to just disarm the situation so uh but it's it's easier said than done right and and I I really like that too because actually with that particular instance uh Stella was in the room our 2 year old and we weren't yelling and I I but just the tone of our voices and we can tell that she senses that so that's a great tool, one for our relationship, but for Stella so that we're not arguing in front of her. That's something I really don't like to do. And and we are able to avoid it most of the time. But the fact that Stella's always there and and we are, uh, we both work from home. So I really want to avoid that because it left such an impression on me uh, when I was a, a kid, I think is a big reason that I don't like that. My parents got divorced when I was 12 and I used to just remember hate seeing them argue. And it was just a, just the worst thing. And obviously I'm, there's probably plenty of research on that for all ages of kids. So that the unilateral disarmament is a great tool, I think for anyone, but especially uh, parents. And and it is hard to do. And my husband is much better at it than I am, (laughs) but I do work at it because it really is a way that you have then the power to not have a situation where you're maybe using a tone of voice that you don't want to do in front of your child. And you want your child to see you model treating your partner with respect, you know, and talking to them in a kind way. And even if your partner is lashing out in the minute, it doesn't mean probably that they hate you or they never loved you or that um, they're just blaming you for everything. It just means in a moment they're frustrated and addressing that and still knowing that they probably still really love you and care about you. And so responding as though that's who they really are, rather than getting into those kinds of um, arguments, just works a lot better. And it then reminds them of who they really are, too. Well, is there any more tips or advice you'd give our listeners who want to improve their vulnerability? Yeah, I think, you know, what I was saying about repairing with the child of getting on their level and really making that eye contact, that when there has been some kind of rupture in your relationship, to do what uh, Dan Siegel calls collaborative communication, where you sit down, where you're both looking at, able to look at one another, and that you talk about how the situation looked from your point of view. And you got to remember that we all have a sovereign mind, that our partner may think very differently than us. And so they may have actually seen the situation completely differently. That doesn't mean they were wrong, um, which is what we usually think. um, And they just didn't get it. It means that all of their experiences that are informing them up until this point um, made the situation look one way where it may have looked completely different to us. And that doesn't mean we were wrong either. It just means that all of our experiences that we've had make us look at it a different way. And sometimes we misheard each other or misunderstood something. And this can particularly happen in text or in emails where you don't have the tone of voice um, or the eye contact and the um, ability to read body language, which communicates a lot more sometimes even than our words. And then really try to come to a shared understanding about it. But, you know, sometimes people say, oh, yes, I want a shared understanding with my partner. I want them to understand how wrong they were. (laughs) That's not what I mean by a shared understanding. I mean, really a collaboratively developed shared understanding of, oh, I see why my partner saw it that way. And here's why I saw it this way. And what maybe what we really need to do is communicate differently about whatever, you know, or try doing something different next time. And that's a very different kind of collaborative working together to solve a problem. Um, And when we can do that, we, again, strengthen our relationship. It's so true. And it really speaks to the heart of what feels like a 
most conflict in a relationship stems from, obviously there's a broad spectrum, but it's just not being on the same page, right? So having this collaborative communication where you sit down and and talk it out and say, this is how I'm experiencing it. And a lot of times when there's conflict, it's because one partner has a very different perspective of what's going on. And it, it's just, it's amazing because here we are, we're all human beings and we can both go outside right now and experience the world in two completely different ways. Not even if, regardless of of interacting, but just what we see, what we hear, what we smell. It's really an amazing, beautiful thing. And that's why relationships are great because you're taking these two perspectives. But when you have that conflict, it's when you're maybe discussing something and those perspectives are not lining up. And uh, so this is a great tool. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that's, that, yeah, like you said, it's really important. And it's realizing your par- partner has a sovereign mind that thinks differently. And, and that's okay. Um, you know, I think making sure that you do have shared experiences um, and you do, you're doing things together is so important. Um, so, you know, we've talked about a number of things that I think people can uh, use to feel closer to each other and you know the closer we feel the more we feel like we can be vulnerable i just think that's really important yeah the shared experiences is great and we always talk about that on the show about a great way to to mix it up is to do something new together and that's going to create that shared experience that's fresh and and bring you guys closer and sarah and i it's funny actually yesterday i took her on a downwind paddle so we're here in uh, hood river it's a very windy place and we we uh do these downwind paddles where it blows 30 miles an hour and I've been doing this for years and so I finally we got a babysitter and I got Sarah out in the canoe and we did we did this eight mile paddle and it it was just I love the fact that she was game to do it and and she had fun and she was sharing something that that's a passion of mine and it definitely was like made us feel closer at the end of that Mm -hmm. yeah no definitely and those kind of share and letting the other person broaden your world trying something you might not have tried is really important. Um, And you learn new things about yourself that you might really enjoy. Well, you've given us and our listeners so many great tools to be more vulnerable with each other and help your partner be more vulnerable or if it's for yourself. Now we got to move forward to the lasting love round. Before we get into the lasting love round, I want to tell you a little bit about our sponsor, Talkspace. We all need to take a little bit better care of ourselves and our mental health is no exception. Pretty much every guest on this show recommends talking to a therapist, either as an individual or a couple, to help improve yourself in the relationships in your life. And that's why we're so excited to be working with Talkspace. They're an online therapy company that makes it easy to connect with an experienced licensed therapist that you're going to pick based on your preferences for as little as $32 a week. And how cool is this? You can send your therapist text, audio, video messages, or even do live video chat. Talkspace therapists are fully licensed and go through rigorous screening processes in addition to thousands of hours of supervised professional training. To match with your perfect therapist, go to Talkspace.com forward slash I do. And as a special offer for our listeners, you can use the coupon code I do and get $30 off your first month and to show support for the podcast. That's Talkspace.com forward slash I do talk space therapy for how we live today. Is there one tool or practice that you can recommend for our listeners to do on a daily basis to improve their relationship? Yeah. Think about three things you're grateful to your partner about every night before you go to bed. Um, you will feel differently toward them. Um, you know, where we focus our attention matters. And it's easy to get caught up in the negative or the annoying things that our partner did that day and 
living like the two of you do in very close quarters, spending your days in close quarters, that can be very easy to find. And instead focusing on the real positives that, and they can be small things, you know, a smile, uh, you know, bringing you a cup of coffee. It doesn't, I'm not talking about they have to be these huge things, but focusing on those positive giving things that your partner does. And in general, being generous <laughs> toward your partner is an incredible mental health principle. Um, you'll feel better about yourself, but your partner will also benefit. That's a great practice. And then tell them, right? Is that is that part of it? Yeah. Things? But, yeah. Or we'll just, but even just you, if you don't tell them, you're going to have more warm feelings toward them. And they'll experience it. You know, I mean, it could become a joke of, okay, well, what are your three things, you know? Um, but it doesn't even matter so much as shifting your perspective. You're going to be a lot warmer toward your partner. And small acts of kindness really um, matter a lot in a relationship. But there's kind of four parts to, to generosity that people don't always think about. One is doing something that your partner would be meaningful to them. Um, not just giving what we want to give when we want to give it. So a mother was telling me the other day that she likes to make a bunch of healthy snacks when her daughter brings over friends. Um, her daughter doesn't appreciate it. <laughs> um, she feels intruded on when her mother does this. So, you know, it's doing something that's sensitive to what the other person would want. Um, and then it's uh, also being willing to acknowledge that your partner did something generous toward you <laughs> um, to say thank you, which is hard if you like to be the giver and it's harder for you to receive. Um, and then it's, you know, letting the other person do things for you and showing your appreciation. So letting it go in both directions and both people being able to experience uh, and say that they're appreciative for whatever generosity is given, that really matters. Um, and small acts of kindness will make your relationship just go a lot smoother. Is there a book or resource you could recommend for our listeners who want to improve their relationship? Um. Yes, I mean, there are probably a number of them, but um, one that I think of offhand is a book called Fear of Intimacy, which really speaks to this issue about vulnerability that my father, Dr. Robert Firestone, wrote, um, where he um, talks about, you know, how we have more fears about really being close or vulnerable than we are aware of, and often that we do various behaviors that keep other people at a distance. But if we can recognize those, we can actually start to shift how we are in a relationship and allow our partner to get closer to us. We've been married for almost three years now. Is there any advice you'd give newlyweds? I would say that, um, that being, you know, often it's at the beginning of the relationship that people always talk about kind of the honeymoon phase or it's easier. Now, if you're newlyweds and moving in for the first time, that also may be not necessarily the honeymoon phase. It might be stressful too, because you're getting used to, living in close quarters with each other. Um, but I think for the, the, the long run, the important thing is that there are going to be ups and downs in the relationship, but that if you can keep a kind attitude toward your partner and express uh, what you really want from your partner, like we were talking about, and be vulnerable, maybe even unilaterally disarm at times, that your relationship is going to go much better. But that relationships do take some work. What advice would you give our single listeners looking for a happy relationship? Single listeners looking for a happy relationship, look for somebody where you feel comfortable be, to be yourself um, and uh, where you feel that you are more yourself around this person, not less of yourself, that you're not editing yourself or just trying to impress them or trying to take on the things that they like to make them like you. You want somebody who likes you for you and who draws out the best in you. And that's, I think, is the most important thing to look for in a partner. If they're also honest and open in their communication, then you've got a very winning combination. Well, Dr. Firestone, this has been an amazing interview. So much stuff that I know Sarah and I are going to be able to use, and I know that our listeners will find valuable. So why don't we finish by having you tell our listeners where they can find you, and then we'll say goodbye. Okay. Well, your listeners, if they want to find out more information from me or the work of a lot of actually great experts, uh, they could come to our website, which is psychalive.org. Um, on that, we have e-courses that we teach, including how to create your ideal relationship. 
Uh, we have webinars, uh, some that are free to the public and some that are for professionals, uh, so people working with couples could benefit from. And um, we also have blogs and information from a great variety of people, including guest webinars with some really incredible uh, people in the field who know a lot about relationships. And we also have video excerpts from uh, many experts in the field that are on our Psycholive YouTube channel that people might benefit from, um, including many relationship experts uh, and people who have a lot of good information about parenting as well. Because our areas of, of interest on our website, Psycholive, are being alive to yourself, being alive to your romantic relationships, and being alive to your children. Excellent. Well, all of those links and your recommended book uh, and all your uh, great tools will be on our website at idopodcast.com. And our listeners know to go there and, and to find all those resources. And again, we appreciate you for coming on the show. And thanks so much. Oh, you're so welcome. I really appreciate the chance to answer your questions and to think about these things because it made me think about what I'm grateful for with my husband, too. Hey guys, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you haven't signed up for our 14-day Happy Couple Challenge yet, head on over to our website at idopodcast.com forward slash 14 to sign up today.